Okay, so welcome uh, back to uh, to the Morphy Today Lecture Series, uh, sponsored by the BBVA Foundation and uh, co organized by the Spanish National Research Council, the Lombok Horizon 2020 uh, project, and in coordination with the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, the Digital Demography Panel, who uh, we are co organizing this, uh, this uh, workshop today. We will be uh, nice. uh, transmitting this uh, workshop uh, live uh, through Periscope and, and Twitter. So we have uh, the pleasure to have Emilio Tagini, who is the director of the Mass Planck Institute for Demography Research in Rostock, in Germany, and uh, Sophia Hill, that uh, is uh, working as well at the Mass Planck Institute for Demography Research in, in Rostock. Uh, Emilio Zagini, a part of the director, is the affiliate associate professor of sociology at the University of Washington, Seattle, where he is also a data science fellow of the eScience Institute. Zagini is a demographer who uses mathematical, statistical, and computationally intensive approaches to study the causes and consequences of population dynamics. Uh, motivated by the ambition to improve people's lives through scientific study of our society, he is consolidating a portfolio that leverages uh, interdisciplinary approaches to monitor demographic change, to explain population processes, and to predict future demographic outcomes. He uh, is uh, best known for his pioneering work on using web and social media data for the study migration processes, and uh, he uh, will be. Uh, uh, is the kind of topic that we will be uh, today uh, presenting in this workshop. Uh, in 2016, he received the Trailblazer Award for, from the European Association for Population Studies uh, for his uh, role in developing the field of digital and computational demography. And he has published in most of the most important journals in demography and statistical science. And Sofia is uh, uh, he, she's, uh, currently uh, her research is focused on migrants, cultural assimilation, and nature stratification. She studied these topics through the use of social media data, Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, Sofia was the head previously of the demographic analysis, analysis department of the National Population Council in Mexico, where she used numerical approaches to estimate from mortality rate at municipal level. So uh, welcome Emilio and uh, welcome to everyone uh, here in the audience. One uh, of the reasons very excited to be part of this uh, initiative is that uh, this event is bringing together many people, many institutions, from IUSSP to projects funded from different types of uh, agencies in Europe. And so I think that this is really the way to move forward by cooperating, by collaborating, by working together and helping each other. I think this, one, this is one of the ways we can really uh, advance the fields of the moment. And so I'm really excited to, to, be part, uh, to be part of this. Now, today's event is also the first event of a new IUSSP panel. It's a sort of kick-off event for the panel on digital demography. So for this panel, Francesco Villa and I are serving as chair of the panel. And the panel also includes among scientific members, Monica Alexander from the University of Toronto, Dennis Fian from UC Berkeley, Perini Kashap from the University of Oxford, Yelena Mejova from the EC Foundation, Diego Ramiro Farinas from the Spanish National Research Council, and Ingmar Weber from the Qatar Computing Research Institute. So this is the first event for this new panel. At the same time, it's also a continuation of a series of events that organize a number of uh, uh, workshops with uh, the previous panel, the panel that came before this digital demography panel, there was the panel on big data and population processes. And so if you want to see some of the materials for uh, previous workshops that were organized, you can find all of them uh, at this uh, link. Or you can just Google uh, big data and population processes, IUSSP, and you'll find that. And this is also a continuation of uh, a number of courses that uh, Many of us uh, in the panel have been teaching, and myself have been teaching, well, I taught a course on data science and population processes at the University of Washington. It was a quarter long uh, type of event. Today we're only a few hours, so it's going to be a little bit different. But if you want to know more, if you want to look at the reading list for this uh, course, you can find more information at this uh, link. 
<coughs> All right, so for today, <coughs> we have uh, three main goals. So the first goal is to discuss how we can extract meaningful demographic information from data that are typically noisy and non-representative, such as data from social media sources. So that's the first goal. The second goal is to sort of get us get our hands dirty and actually work with code and to collect some data, get this started with data collection. And we show some examples with the Facebook data for advertisement platform. And then an important goal is also to form community and actually having fun with these types of uh, activities. So in terms of the plan, my plan for the first part of, uh, of this workshop is to discuss at least three tools of the digital democracy. And I, th I chose these tools that are the Swiss Army Knife, the leverage and the tape measure. And there's a reason for each of them. So the Swiss Army Knife is because as social scientists we have a number of tools that are already available to us in our arsenal. They are not perfect for the new types of data that we encounter, but we can use them in different ways to make sense of new data. And I'll show some examples in that context. And the leverage is because we often deal with imperfect data. That's what we have, that's what we have always been doing as researchers, but it's very important to find ways to make the most uh, out of what we have in order to say something about other contexts in which we don't have data. And then the last one is the tape measure, and the idea is that for many problems that we encounter, there are issues related to metrics, how to measure things in new ways, well, new, met new metrics, as well as combine potentially new data sources with uh, existing data sources or existing approaches like existing survey uh, approaches in order to gain more information. So for the first part, I will talk about these three tools. Then Sophia will come in for the second part and she will add an additional tool, which is the hammer of the mallet. And so the idea here is that for the second part, what we will focus on is on building code, building reproducible code. And so Sophia will go over a tutorial on the Facebook marketing API on how to actually access uh, some data. If uh, <coughs> here is uh, the link to the repository that Sophia will, will discuss later. And so you can take a look uh, uh, at this bit.ly iossp sophia you will find some of the code and information that Sophia will discuss. <coughs> we also wrote it here, uh, and you can find some information here. But so the idea is that for the second part, Sophia will talk about the paper, and then we show how she collected the data, we show some code, and then provide pointers to the repository in order to fully reproduce the paper. Now, in terms of Hammer, at some point, during the second part, you may want to think of the hammer this way. Like, uh, it's very, very likely that something will go wrong. Like, you will not be able to create an app, uh, or everything will work fine, but like, the R installation that you have is too old, or too new, or there will be some packages that are missing. And so your first reaction would be that you want to use the hammer to smash your machine, but I hope that nobody will, will do that. So just be prepared, be patient, we will try to help as much as we can. Some problems could possibly be solved within a few minutes, others we can sort of look uh, into them later. But the idea is that, uh, as I said, we are trying to form a community, and if we can't solve all the problems now, we'll be uh, friends forever, and we can help each other later on. Now, <clears throat> before we go on, I just want to have like quick ground introduction if uh, all of you can just say your name and where you're from so, so we just get a sense of who is, uh, who is in the room. Maybe we can start from here. My name is Francis Covitiana and I work in this institute, in the Andalusia Statistical Institute and I work in uh, population values of Andalusia in about 50, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I worked in Ireland, in Ireland, yes. for a lot of time. Um, now I like many people work too in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
My name is Nachatra Singh. I am from Central School Demographic Studies. I am a postdoc researcher there. I have just finished my PhD last year. So it's just uh, my research is on international migration. Hey, my name is Nidia, and I'm a neuro patient from uh, my name is Dan Paolo Lanzieri. I work in Eurostat, where I lead the section on demography migration and protections. Did I clarify in Vienna, Bertin Wittgenstein Center? If that's probably, you don't know. <laughs> it's a combination of Vienna Institute of Demography, uh, ESS Population Group, and uh, Business University's Socioeconomics Department. Uh, I work, I've been involved in a few projects using Facebook and Twitter data, but I've never collected the data myself, so I'm happy. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Bokorn University in Milan. I'm uh, working on uh, international migration with a focus on Syria refugee status, in Turkey especially. And I use Google uh, Trans data, but I've never used Facebook data so far, so I'm um, so very happy to be here. My name is Maria uh, I work at the Institute of Institute um, in the service of Institution. Uh, we manage the privacy uh, social network and spaces uh, So I will I will come on with this uh, learning things. Uh, my name is Vanessa Santos. I work in the University of Society in the Longford project and my PhD thesis is about mortality and <laughs> relations and I'm a senior to do a job of project also and I work in Taragoda de la Entrades in the UK. So I'm informatic. Okay, so I'm the project manager of Longford and I'm the <laughs> <laughs> in my email in the last few days, so I have to know you. Okay, so I'm Jose Ramasco. Uh, I'm a physicist uh, working in the Institute for Cold Disciplinary Physics in, in Palma, New York. And uh, I have been working in uh, mobility, uh, transport, and uh, these kind of things with this, this type of data. But we are mostly focused on mobile phone records and uh, Twitter. So this Facebook uh, question will be interesting. So. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Sami Noref. I'm a postdoc at Emilio's lab, Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research. I'm a computer scientist by training and I work on the mobility of scientists using publications. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Daria. I'm also a participant of Lompo Project. I'm a geographer, I'm working at the uh, Estre Spain company. And um, as a PhD student, uh, my research is focusing on different aspects of uh, heat waves, uh, and I'm working a lot with social media big data, with Twitter in particular. Cool. So uh, I'm Diego Ramiro. I'm the BI of the Lombok Project. I'm the director of the Institute of uh, Geography, Economy, and, uh, and Demography of the Spanish National Research Council. Mm -hmm. Cool. This is a very nice and diverse field. So we can. Uh, Get started now. Well, what you want to remember is that the person sitting by you will be your very best friend for the next couple of hours because if something goes wrong, you can always check with the person who is sitting right by you. And often, maybe the same code that is working on his or her machine will not work on your machine, but that's what, uh, what happens. So, we will not look uh, at code for like the next uh, maybe 40 45 minutes, we'll look into that later. But if uh, you want to like, get started, you find some material here, especially if you haven't gotten the chance to go through the first step that Sophia uh, discussed, you can find all of that in the repository. If you don't get the chance to go to do it now or you haven't done it, Sophia will still go over all of them uh, briefly, but uh, you may want to take a look. Alright, so in terms of outline for the first part. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, using one specific technique that is known as difference in differences in order to reduce bias in various types of social media data. Now we will give some examples uh, in this context, that's sort of like the Swiss Army knife. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, 
problems relating to calibration and making the most of what we have from uh, the data that we are that are available to us. And then finally, developing metrics and complementing found data, what uh, is available with other form, more traditional forms of data collection. So first, I'll just go over quickly on the refresh of the difference in difference approach. So this is a technique that is very common among economists, for example, to evaluate the impact of policy interventions. Say that, that there are two phenomena that are going on parallel tracks, and at some point there is an event or a policy uh, action, and then one of the events sort of deviates from this uh, parallel line. The key question is to understand what is the impact of a specific event on the outcome we're interested in. And so what we want to estimate is uh, sort of this red line, which is the difference between uh, <coughs> the outcome for the treatment group compared to what we would have expected if the trends had persisted over time. So this is this delta is the type of quantity that we want to estimate, which is a difference in difference. The treat post minus the control post minus treat pre minus control pre. So it's this red line. And the nice thing about this approach is that it can be cast into a regression form in a very uh, easy way. So if we have an outcome and we express it in a regression form where we have indicator variables, say I treat is equal to one if we're in the case of the treatment, zero otherwise, I post is equal to one if post, zero otherwise, and then an interaction of treatment and post. And it turns out that the coefficient for the interaction term is our estimate of the difference <coughs> estimate. And we think of why we can <coughs> take a look at our regression line or regression formula, the expected value of our outcome given that the treatment is one and the post is one, say for in the treatment post, then uh, this value over here is one, this value over here is one, these two are one. So it's equal to beta naught plus beta one plus beta two plus beta three. If we're in a situation where we are we have treatment equal to one but not post, so we're in a pre situation and treatment, then the outcome outcome is beta naught plus beta one times one plus beta two times zero, so it's zero, plus beta three times the product of one and zero is zero. So beta 3 is also disappears. So this value is beta naught plus beta 1. Same thing, we can do the same thing for all combinations. Treatment equals 0, post equal 1 is beta naught plus beta 2. Treatment equals 0, post equals 0, that's beta naught. So if we take all of these and we put them into a the table, these are our coefficients. And then if we look at, uh, say, the difference between uh, say post treatment and control, that's this value, the difference between this and this is this one, and then the difference of the differences, that is the difference of this and the dif this minus this, is equal to our coefficient for our uh, interaction term. And we can also do it the other way around, we can take the difference between this and that, that's this quantity, the difference between this and that is this quantity, and the difference of the differences is our uh, beta 3 parameter. So that's a sort of standard type of uh, approach in social sciences, but it can be useful to make sense of digital trace data as well. And so I'm going to show you a couple of examples where we use that approach and where that approach could be potentially useful. So one is in the case of a natural disaster, in particular in the context of Hurricane uh, Maria in Puerto Rico where we can evaluate migration mobility of people from Puerto Rico before and after the disaster. And so this is done with Facebook data for advertisers. So if you go to facebook.com slash business, you can click on create an ad, and you will be shown a page that looks uh, like this. Here you can choose the target audience that you want to target for your ad campaign, Say, if you choose people who live in New York, 
age and all age groups, everyone, people who live in Puerto Rico but are now living in New York, then Facebook gives you a value that is a potential reach that is 110,000. This is a rough estimate that Facebook makes. There could be all sorts of problems with, the, with this number, but this is what, I'm just saying this is what Facebook tells us, what Facebook thinks the number of users are. And so, it would be tedious to do this uh, manually, but we will see later that it can be done, we can collect this data in a programmatic way, and so here we show us some, some code. Now, if we have this type of data, then we can use a difference in different type of approach to evaluate the pre and post Hurricane Maria on migration or short-term mobility of uh, people from uh, Puerto Rico. So we can look at the percentage change in Puerto Rican migrants compared to international <coughs> migrants in various United States states before and after the hurricane. You use a difference in difference approach to estimate this percentage change and then transform the percentage change into population counts by multiplying for the baseline population that we obtain from the American community survey. So this is a case where normally we would have very good data from the American community survey, but the timeline is not quite right for that survey, since the survey gives us estimates that are at an annual level. In this case, we have like short-term mobility, and then people went back to the island, and by the time the survey was filled in, a lot of people might have come back. So that's why we need to use an approach like this. So we need to verify that uh, the two sort of, uh, that, the, that the processes that we are looking at were working on parallel tracks. So this uh, figure shows proportional change of uh, migrants from Puerto Rico, say Puerto Ricans and non-Puerto Ricans, to various United States. And we see that for most states, except for Florida, they are moving along parallel lines right up until the time of the hurricane. And then there is a sort of uh, rapid increase of Puerto Ricans compared to other migrants. The reason why Florida is not on sort of parallel tracks is because, is because of the timing. There is a lot of seasonal migration to uh, Florida that is due to various types of jobs that people do, and vacation and so on. And so this is not exactly on a parallel line because of that. Because during the spring, people go uh, to Florida for a number of other reasons, more from Puerto Rico than from other places. But if we sort of uh, ignore Florida from this sort of like uh, exercise to verify whether the things are moving on parallel lines, we'll see that uh, Puerto Rico, that's the blue line, and this is the proportional change, and non Puerto Ricans are moving along similar tracks, and then Puerto Ricans shoot up, non Puerto Ricans uh, don't increase as much. So we can use this information and the difference in difference type of approach to evaluate things like the percent change in Puerto Ricans in various states in the US. The percent change right after the hurricane. And so we can get some information that uh, in terms of increase right after the hurricane for different states for the percentage increase, then we can multiply that by the baseline population that the American Community Survey gives us uh, before the hurricane to get <coughs> some uh, estimates of the numbers. And so these, uh, these numbers are consistent with other approaches, for example, passenger survey data and so on. The key uh, sort of the key gain that we can make by using these types of data compared to say flight information is that we also get the age structure. So for example, we can get information about <coughs> the types of groups that are moving more compared to other groups. So for, in this case, we saw that it was mostly young male who sort of moved right away and then came came back. And one other interesting thing is that we can also look at the return migration. How many of those people in the following three months came back to, uh, to Puerto Rico? And we see that many people from Florida, from Massachusetts, sort of went back to uh, Puerto Rico within six months uh, of the return. So it gives us a general sense of what's happening in terms of short term mobility. 
Now, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to show a second example that is based on geolocated Twitter data. Now, before I, I'll, I'll go over the overviews of like different tools and how they've been applied to different contexts before we go into the hands-on part. But if you have any questions, please stop me any time where the idea is that this would be more of like a, a conversation about different possibilities. Also because this is not necessarily exact science, it's, uh, as I showed you, it's a, a Swiss army knife, so it's more of a MacGyver type of thing at this point, where we're trying to still make the most of what, what we have. So, the second example is about sort of evaluating trends in mobility from geolocated Twitter data. And so here is the same idea that we can use uh, uh, we can use a difference in difference type of approach. So say well the sample of geolocated tweets, there's no demographic information, there's no we didn't really have official statistics to calibrate the model. And, uh, and so the reason why we don't have official statistics is because say if you download some data now, there's a delay between between uh, the time when the official statistics are already available for us. So if we download some data now, we don't really have uh, something we can compare the, the statistics with. But we can still use a difference in different systems to offer. So say that here is the raw data for each period of four months here, May, August 2011, September, December 2011. We have a number of countries. And for each period of time, we can estimate a rate of out-migration, the rate of immigration from that uh, country. So, we have these numbers, these are just the raw numbers which tell us what the rate of outmigration is for the specific sample of Twitter data that we have. And there could be various reasons why they go up, say this black line here is the average of OECD country, the red one is Mexico, this dotted line is the US, but these changes could be driven by all sorts of things, even changes in behavior. Maybe people start tweeting more with geolocation or with less with geolocation, or more people sort of sign up for the uh, for Twitter. There could be compositional effects. Say that uh, this uh, sort of increase could be completely unrelated to underlying patterns. Say if more and more young people sign up for Twitter and young people tend to migrate at a higher rate than older people, even if there's no change in the underlying population, Twitter will show us that the uh, rates are increasing. So we need to be aware of all of these problems when we sort of think of this data, including those standard compositional effects. <clears throat> so what we can do is that we can sort of think of a hypothetical model for the way the the data are generated, we can imagine that there is a true rate for a specific location, and then there is a, a bias associated to the location, and what we observe, say from Twitter data, is a combination of the true rate plus some bias for location I. Similarly, for location Z, we have a true rate and some level of bias that could be different. And then we need some assumptions, and so one assumption could be that uh, the additive bias biases are different across regions. Say for country Z, the bias is N, whereas for country I, the bias is N. But they may be constant over a short periods of time. So that could be a reasonable assumption. We can say the bias for French people who use Twitter is different from the one of Spanish people. But over a fairly short period of time, the bias for France it does not change and the bias from Spain does not change too much. So if we, <coughs> if we do that, we can think a little bit in terms of a difference in difference approach. Say that we have rates for France and Spain, these are just hypothetical numbers. France at time t, 0.5, France at time t plus 1.7, Spain at time t, 0.4, Spain at time t plus 1.5. We can define this sort of differential in the variation of uh, these rates. If we have the true rate, we can take France t plus 1 minus France times t minus Spain t plus 1 minus Spain times t. That's the difference in the increment. We can compute it. It's uh, 0 0.7 minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.4. 
we get 0.2 minus 0.1. So if we have the true underlying data and we want to get an estimate of the differential in this variation, we can say it's 0.1. But the key problem is that we don't have that. We are like in a status category of the cave. Or we, we know that there is some true under there. Out there, we are sitting on a bench in a cave. And all we can see is some sort of biased uh, representation of these truths. So all, what we want to do is to try to reconstruct this truth as best as, uh, as we can. So one approach is to think, well, let's say that uh, the bias for friends is 0.2 for both periods of time, and the bias for Spain is 0.1 for both periods of time. Then if we evaluate this difference in the increments across uh, time, so we do the same thing, it's 0.9 minus 0.7 minus 0.6 minus 0.5, then what we get, we get again 0.1, which is the same that we found before from the exact data. So this is to say that in this case, if the assumption is true, if the assumption that the bias could be different across countries but remains constant over time, then we can sort of filter out the biases by looking at differences. So we may not be able to say something about what's happening in one country one single point in time, but perhaps there is hope that we can say something about uh, trends. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, that's what I was just saying. So, so instead of uh, taking this data, we can, say, we can say the raw data are not, have a lot of, potentially a lot of bias, if we look at difference in differences, we can say we can look at sort of differences compared to the average trend, for example, and be able to say something about trends in which countries sort of shorter mobility is going up and in which countries it's going down. And so this is an example, another example of how this difference of differences approach could be could be used. Now Question, what if uh, the assumption that we made is bad? What if there are reasons to believe that uh, the bias is not additive, but is multiplicative? Say, for a location i, instead of having a rate uh, plus a value n, will be a rate that multiplies a bias that remains constant. What can we do? Hello, hmm? Can you work about the <laughs> Yeah, that's the, that's the right question. So, as demographers, the first thing that, uh, that we do, or the first thing that we learn when we open a demographic book, is that population trends are exponential, or stable populations are exponential. So, what we do is that we take logs. And so, the approach here could be to take logs. If we take logs, we transform this multiplicative approach into an additive type of approach, that type of uh, relationship. And then we can look use the difference the differences on uh, logs. Once we get the values, then we can really transform things into the original unit we are interested. In. Okay, so does this make sense so far? You have any questions? You want me to stop? Uh, to stop me? Just ask me anytime. And also. Don't worry, I will, not, I will not be talking forever. We'll also have like a little break and then we'll get into uh, uh, actual coding. All right, so that was the first part. Now I want to, to talk a little bit about a different type of problems. So in this situation, we had no sort of ground truth to compare values and what we wanted to do was to evaluate trends. But there are other types of situations where we want to either calibrate the data or we have some information and we want to be able to say something about something else. That's where, that's where we need the, the leverage. So the idea for these uh, general problems is that perhaps we have some data for, a, for the same uh, sort of geography and for the same time period from both some web sources and some official statistics. But then for other areas or for other time periods, we, we don't have any official statistics or data from surveys or other types of uh, representative samples. 
what we want to, but we might have uh, web data for those uh, type of situations. So what we want to do is to leverage the existing data to understand the biases in these web uh, sources when we have both data and then use the so bias correction model in order to say something about context for which we don't have uh, other data sources. <clears throat> so here is, a, is an example uh, still related to migration. Say that we look at uh, out migration rates from a number of European countries. We have some very good data that uh, what I would call silver standard, like I wouldn't call them gold standard because migration is very, very difficult to measure. And so, and there are all sorts of issues related to uh, migration measurement with uh, uh, all sorts of approaches. But like the best we can get is this. For example, from Eurostat, we can get various uh, immigration rates by age for a number of countries. This is Germany, mm -hmm. Ireland, uh, Italy, Hungary, and, and so on. And then <clears throat> we have some web or social media data for Europe and for other countries. We want to be able to say something about other countries. Say for Europe, we can say we, we know something, but we don't know anything about the Philippines, for example. So one, uh, one approach is to develop some correction biases. And this, <clears throat> this is just a sort of general idea that can be tweaked in different contexts, but the problem is fairly, uh, is fairly broad. So we can, for example, define a parameterization for a correction factor. We can say, for example, that the correction weight or the correction factor can be related to a measure of internet penetration rate or other types of uh, uh, proxies for internet use. And then we can come up with, uh, this is an example, it doesn't have to be that way, there could be all sorts of functions. In this specific case, we have a function of penetration rate, penetration or internet penetration rate for a specific age group, group, gender, age, and country as a function of a parameter k. And we see if the penetration rate is 1, so we would have e to the minus k times 1, so this whole thing would be uh, equal to this, they would cancel out, and so the function will be equal to 1. So if everybody is using the internet, then there's no need to correct. But if uh, only a fraction of the people are using internet, then we might have to correct. And the correction, the extent to which bias varies from the internet might depend on uh, different factors. What we want to do is to estimate the value of k of our parameter. So in, in general, we want to generate corrected estimates that, are, that take the raw data, they multiply by the correction factor, takes, account, takes into account the biases, and then some of the scaling factors, potentially for different definitions in the ground truth data. And so from a statistical point of view, we want to find the values of the rescaling factor and the parameter k in our function that maximize the probability of observing the number of migrants given the ground truth that is available. So here is the ground truth that we consider, we consider this in the number of other countries, and then we want to obtain a maximum likelihood estimates for the two parameters, the shape parameter, which tells us the extent to which uh, uh, for different age groups or for different countries things are changing with internet penetration rate, and a level parameter that so pushes everything up and down to match uh, different definitions across countries. So we can say if Eurostat rates with the true age specific rates for the population, the key question is what flaws would we expect to observe in the online platform population that we have. So we have a sample size n in the online platform for a given age group and country. P will be the, the true age specific migration rate for the given country that comes from Eurostat. And the expected number of migrants in the online platform for a specific age group and country will be given by binomial and times p. And so we, are, we know that in the binomial distribution, the expected variance is sigma, sigma square is n times p times 1 minus p. 
and then we can sort of use a normal uh, approximation. So if you use a normal approximation, then <coughs> for a group A, that could be a sort of age group, a specific country, and a specific sex, sex group, we want to know the probability of observing the number of migrants of XA given the rate in your stuff. And that would be a normal, so technically it's a binomial distribution, but given that we have a large sample size, we can approximate it with a normal distribution. And so the number of these uh, values depends on the parameters k and l, and so the problem becomes an optimization problem of finding the uh, parameter k and l that maximize the likelihood of observing the so the way we, I sort of went over this is not necessarily important, but in, in general the idea is that we want to calibrate something against the existing ground truth data. <clears throat> and then multiply across all groups that we have if we assume that they can be uh, considered independent. If, they, if they are more complex, if there's more complexity and there's no independence, then we will have to do something slightly different. But so, the key is that if we do that for Euro European countries, then we can apply the same model to other countries for which we have internet aggression rate, data from an online platform, but we don't have uh, official statistics or we think that the official statistics may be uh, not suitable for what, uh, for what we need. And so, for example, uh, this could have been, we applied this to the Philippines, and this was like, this is a note paper, where at the time we used Yahoo data, Yahoo emails, but the, the, the idea here is that it doesn't really matter what you're using, it's more like uh, about the approaches that, and the types of class of problems. So for the Philippines, without any corrections, we will see basically the values at the top of this gray area, we will see much higher migration for older people, and this is because older people like the Philippines may be more highly educated, the <coughs> income, they may tend to use indoor more and also be uh, more likely to market. But after correction, we get much uh, lower values. They seem to be more uh, reasonable and consistent with what uh, we could have expected. So this is one approach. I also want to... <coughs> uh, so this is just a summary of what I was just saying. What I want to point out is some sort of limitations of this general, this general approach. So regardless of the specific application, whether we're working with Facebook data or Yahoo or Twitter and so on, for these types of problems of calibration, there is a key aspect that sort of that is a main limitation and I think it's important to be aware. When we have this type of correction factor and we try to sort of calibrate data, what we're typically doing is that we calibrate against a sort of narrow range. So typically, countries that have high internet penetration rates are also countries that have better migration statistics. And so in the context of calibration for European, against European data, we were looking at countries that were mainly in this space. So we are looking at the narrow range of internet penetration rates in order to extrapolate to countries like Brazil, the Philippines, or African countries where internet penetration rate is much lower. And so we have to be aware that even the smaller to level mistake in a model or the even small level of uncertainty in the sort of estimate of this type of slope can like, propagate quite easily. And when we try to make uh, projections or when we try to project to countries where there is more need of data, the error may become pretty big quickly. And so that's something that, that's a general problem and we need, we need to be aware of that. So does this make sense? I, I don't know, so the, the, the K estimator is for our country? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, for different countries. It's the same estimation of K. It's yes. different for A and Z, but for countries, it is the same. Yeah, and uh, yeah, but uh, it, it doesn't really matter exactly whether it's the same for countries or not. It's uh, the key is that if we have, to, we have to find some values, basically, if we think of this k as a measure of slope, we need to estimate this slope 
based on data points, there will be a cloud of points that is here. And so if we make a small error here, and we try to estimate something that is here, we may be off uh, uh, significantly. And that's, uh, that's just a general problem when we try to calibrate against the countries that have better data and say something about countries that don't have better data. Okay. For example, if you're comparing those countries that have better data on the internet access rates and some that not, um, can you, is it, does it make sense to use a more general uh, calibration, or would you rather use the, the raw estimates? So, uh, I think that if, if, uh, if we try to say something about the developing countries, there's a trade-off, because those are the most interesting countries for which we want to be able to say something, but we also have to accept that there's more uncertainty. and. Uh, the key is to find, um, and so there's one problem that is about developing the best possible calibration model. And so I just showed a simple example, and there could be much better models that can, that can be done. And I think that's one class of problems. But then, regardless of that, what I was saying is that even if we have the best calibration model, it will always be based on a cloud of data points that are in one small corner of the of our portfolio. And so ideally we need to sort of take into account that type of uncertainty that comes with uh, estimating something at the other corner when we only have data points at one end. And uh, I'm not sure if there is a clear solution to that uh, to that problem. Okay. Okay, so now I want to show another example that is based on LinkedIn data and it's about like a subpopulation of uh, uh, migrants. In this case, it is professionals who move to the, to the US. This uh, is a word that was motivated by the need to generate some estimates in, mig in migration trends of uh, skilled workers to the US. And so we're like anonymized uh, Education and employment histories from LinkedIn, which is an excellent source of information in that case, because country of residence can be inferred from uh, people's CV or other information like education, sector of employment, and so on. So I just want to show you this uh, uh, type of chart. This is a chart that is that shows the probability of migrating to the United States by year for different types of groups, like these are workers based on employment with different types of levels of education, or uh, students. And so these, there's no correction here, these are, this is just uh, uh, samples from LinkedIn. So if we look at this, these are employment-based fraction of people across the entire world that are LinkedIn users who moved to the US. And if we see this, we see that this probability was going up, then it sort of goes down. Uh, some of this is related to the financial crisis in the 1990s, then it, go, it sort of goes further down after 9-11, uh, and there's a sort of further stall here at the, at the time of the, at the time of the recession. So it seems like uh, this is just for data use, so there's no sort of uh, uh, it's not attempt yet to sort of generalize to the population. These are uh, LinkedIn users, and we see that it's going down. And if we look at the global level, it seems that this is a company with a rise of uh, the rest of Asia. So as fewer people, as fewer LinkedIn users move to the United States, more people uh, are moving to uh, Asia, for example. Or within Asia, they move to different countries. And so, let's see, here we didn't really have uh, uh, good data to calibrate or to have a calibration model, and so the question is, can we still say something or, or not? Or what can we say from this type of data? And there are a number of sort of uh, uh, problems. One of the problems is that there could be changing composition of, uh, uh, 
population in the country. So since uh, LinkedIn is a US company, we might expect that uh, if uh, people who sort of move to the US are more likely to uh, sort of set up an LinkedIn account than people who move to France. Or the behavior of people may sort of change. And since we have one data point, we only have school. We can look at all CVs at one point in time. It could be all sorts of compositional changes. And so, <clears throat> what uh, what we did in this case was to sort of repeat the analysis on different cores. And so, we are used to think of cores in terms of work cores, but we can also think of cores in terms of uh, the day when people sign up for uh, a platform. So here we suspected that uh, if you sign up uh, uh, for LinkedIn in 2000, you may be different in some unobserved ways than someone who signs up for LinkedIn in 2010. But then the data is the same because once you're on LinkedIn, you may upload all your, uh, your CV. And so in this case, it was useful to sort of repeat the analysis, the same analysis for only the people who signed up in 2000, only those who signed up in 2021, 22, and so on. And it was sort of reassuring that uh, the results uh, uh, were consistent across all. One uh, other thing, one other sort of thing that we could do was to look at uh, an estimate of um, from the American Community Survey. So we normalized things at uh, 100 for the year 2000. We looked at, uh, so this is uh, an estimate for people with a college degree or higher who moved to the US. And uh, we did the same thing for DACS and <coughs> for uh, LinkedIn. And so what we see is that the value for DACS tends to be lower than the value for LinkedIn. And so this is not exactly, uh, is not going to say that the LinkedIn data are good or, or not, but uh, in a way it's really showing because we were showing that uh, migration to the US is going down and perhaps like it's going down just because of compositional changes. But when we look at uh, these types of information, if we compare what we can compare, people by level of education, it turns out that uh, LinkedIn is overestimating uh, migrants to the US. And so we're saying that migration is going down but the fact that LinkedIn might be overestimating may give us a little bit more, uh, maybe reassuring in terms of saying that migration is actually going down. So we can't really say too much about this data and the value of, of the data points, but perhaps at least we can say something about the trends. And it's also not proper science, but it's about uh, uh, sort of like being able to say something or not to say something. In some cases we can, in some cases we can't, and we have to sort of point out to all the limitations that are attached to this. Uh, this right, last part for this, <coughs> which is uh, developing metrics and complementing found data with traditional forms of uh, data collection. So here I want to show an example that is about uh, cultural assimilation using Facebook data for advertisers. So the key question is, can we use the Facebook data for advertisers to evaluate whether immigrants are <coughs> in the mainstream uh, culture of the whole society? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. Now this is a long, long-standing question in sociology. According to the straight line assimilation hypothesis, the more time immigrants spend in the whole society, the more similar they become to the mainstream uh, group in the society. But that theory has been challenged recently by uh, a number of theories, in, including the segmented assimilation uh, hypothesis, in which natives and immigrants borrow cultural practices from each other, and immigrants can sort of assimilate to different strata of uh, the whole society, depending on uh, the number of uh, uh, the number of factors, including residential choices. So there are a number of uh, indicators of assimilation, but culture is quite difficult to quantify. Perhaps we can use interest that people expressed uh, on, uh, on Facebook. 
So for this study, we look at the cultural markers, but again, the, 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 the content of the study is not as important as the general idea that we want to develop uh, new metrics for these, uh, for these, for these uh, uh, new metrics from new types of data and evaluate whether they're valid or, or not. So we use the same data that uh, we were talking about earlier, and then we will sort of work on in practice later. These are people who live in Texas, who used to live in Mexico, and are interested in bachata music. We get a number that says 380,000 people. And we can do the same thing for all sorts of uh, interests and uh, evaluate the prevalence of different interests for different groups. So go over a sort of toy example of uh, what, uh, what I'm trying to say. Say that we have that type of data, Facebook data for advertisement, and then we can consider an over oversimplified population in destination countries. Say so we look at uh, Americans living in the US, we can consider only six uh, musical genres, say salsa, rock, pop, rap, mariachi, and computer. So this is obviously like Oversimplification is just a toy example. Facebook will give us some audience sizes. These are made up numbers, but we can have 30 for salsa or pop and so on. Uh, out of 100, this is the prevalence of interest for salsa for Americans in the US, for rock, pop, rock, and so on. We can do the same thing for, say, Mexicans in Mexico, get the prevalence for, for their interest. And then we can compare the prevalence of interest for Americans in the US, Mexicans in Mexico, and this serves as, uh, we can look at the ratio and identify what uh, the sort of top American interests for Americans in America are compared to the uh, interest for Mexicans in Mexico. So we want to like, split what is most typical of Americans in America compared to Mexico, Mexicans in Mexico. Once we get this, then we can look at the interest for Americans in uh, uh, the interest prevalence for, say, Americans in the US, and immigrant Mexican, so not anymore Mexicans in Mexico, but Mexican immigrants in the US. We can take this ratio. And in this uh, oversimplified example, we can see that the distance is that uh, pop is quite popular for both. Uh, <coughs> rap is not so popular for one. Uh, rock is something in the middle. We can take the median as a measure of uh, the average sort of like distance between uh, these two groups, immigrants and people in the destination. And so this was uh, <coughs> a sort of toy example. It can be applied to a number of uh, musical interests. We did it for 740 uh, musical interests. And we, get, uh, we got uh, different values also by different age groups. Now, for that work, we did a number of analysis. One of the main findings is that uh, Mexican immigrants tend to assimilate more. So these are maps of the US. Higher values mean higher assimilation. This is Mexican immigrants compared to the white population, Mexican immigrants compared to the Afri African American population. There is quite a bit of spatial heterogeneity, but the map on the, light, on the right is a little bit lighter on average, meaning that Mexican immigrants tend to assimilate more to the uh, Mexican immigrants tend to assimilate more to the musical taste of African Americans than whites in, in the US. So we could talk a lot just about this, but like what uh, <coughs> what I want to sort of point out are some limitations. So we can we need to develop these <coughs> metrics, we can develop all sorts of metrics, but we need to keep in mind that these always rely on cross-sectional data. We might have lack of we don't have information about generational processes from Facebook data. We don't have information about yes in the country and so on. And so I think that the main sort of question for this type of studies is the validity of the data. Should we, to what extent can we rely on those data? And so the 
The next step, and this is something that um, Andrew Grove, who is a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute, is taking a lead on, is to run a survey. So here we're getting data from ads. We get data that Facebook tells us, like estimates from Facebook. But nothing prevents us from actually sending out an ad to people. So we can say, send an ad to Mexicans living in San Francisco, asking them to take part in the survey. We can give a, a gift card and, uh, and so on and see whether they, first of all, are really Mexicans living in San Francisco, whether the data are valid, and then get uh, some additional information that we wouldn't be able to get just from, uh, uh, from Facebook. Now, if uh, this is about to restart soon, if you see an ad like this on your Facebook, except for Sophia if she travels to Mexico, then there will be some problems, like it means that like, if you see this ad, it means that the targeting is not working too well, but if it's working, <laughs> if, if it works well and we target the right people, hopefully we should get some uh, uh, answer to the survey, and I think that this is a way to sort of complement the traditional forms of data collection with new types of uh, sources. So you are planning here a kind of quota sample? It's a quota sample. So we're planning to uh, yeah, to run a survey on different groups. I mean, it's not probabilistic, that's what I mean. So there are different things can be, yeah, so there are all sorts of problems. And uh, first of all, it's on the Facebook users, who are not uh, necessarily, to start with, they're not representative of, uh, uh, of the underlying population. And so just by that, it wouldn't be probabilistic. The, the first goal is to see whether the information that we can get from the Facebook advertising platform is actually consistent with what... Uh, uh, so are they giving us valid information or are these completely off? And given that we work with those data, can we also say something else about uh, uh, these people? But so there are various things to consider and there are a lot of, sort of like statistical aspects. One thing that is important also to consider, and I don't have an answer to that, that's something that we're sort of working on right now, we're trying to figure out things, is that uh, these tools have been developed for marketers. And so there are all sorts of algorithms behind them that are not necessarily customized for scientists. Say, from a scientific point of view, we would like uh, to have the ad send to people uh, randomly, like regardless of uh, uh, what they do. But it's not completely clear how Facebook sort of like allocates ads as well. So if you clicked on something, you may be more likely to see the ad twice, unless we sort of like, you need to make an effort to make mm -hmm. this approach uh, as random as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this was like the first part, and now I just want to like ease a little bit into the second part. So that's, bear with me for another five minutes, then we'll take a break, and then uh, we'll go to the, move to the hands-on part. Now, I talked about some of the issues with the data, and now one of the key questions is how to access the data. Now, for some databases, we can, it's just a click away, say, if you're interested in working with some Twitter data and you want to get uh, some information quickly from maybe historical data, you can look at the Twitter stream archive. There are a lot, there's a lot of data there. You can just download uh, past data. These are data that people collected and sort of uploaded and shared, and there's a very good way of, uh, of starting. But that data may not include exactly what you need or what uh, it could be a good starting point for other types of data collections. And then for a lot more data sources, you need to make an effort, which typically includes working with an application programming interface. So what we want to do is to have access to data like this. This is a sort of nostalgic type of uh, uh, tweet. <laughs> this is something that has a clear meaning to humans, but it may not necessarily have a clear meaning to machines, or something like uh, something like this. So, 
this is what we see when we look at Twitter tweets, but the same data is stored in this form. So this exact tweet is stored in this form, which is in JSON format, which for those of you who work with R is basically a list. And it contains a number of, uh, so the way this format works is that it's a combination of key and values. For example, we have an ID for the tweet, so each tweet has an ID. So if the key is IDs, and this is the value, this is that specific tweet. And then it, it has a hierarchical forms, values can also be a list. So for the key user, then we have, a we have a series of key and value pairs. So the user ID 8132 that's the uh, ID user for Barack Obama, for example. And so, <coughs> we'll, we'll be working with data that has this format also for uh, the Facebook API, which is the standard format for these types of data. Uh, how do we access them? So, as a human, we access the same data to the website. As a computer, we use an API. And so, typically, a client sends a request to a server and we get the response in, in return. The two aspects that are important one is the authentication. So, all of you have registered for different websites, including Facebook, you're creating the API, you're creating an app. The reason why <coughs> We log in with a username and password is because we want to authenticate. But there are other situations in which, say, we are playing a game and the developer of a game app wants to use uh, the Dropbox API to store video game design. So what you don't want to do is to give away your password to the uh, game developer. So that's why the different types of authentication system <coughs> has been developed, <coughs> which is the API key authentication system. So <coughs> the key is usually a long series of letters and numbers that is distinct from the account owner's login and password, and that has some attached privileges, uh, <coughs> what's possible and what is not possible. And so the owner gives the keys to the application and then you can restrict the privileges attached to them. And so what you did, uh, so if you went through the first steps that Sophia shared and you got your token, that's the idea uh, behind it. You need to authenticate with Facebook, Facebook recognizes you, then you can collect the data and the token is part of this uh, API key authentication. So for example, if uh, imagine that you want to know some of the demographic attributes of the famous demographer, Ronald Lee. You can take this picture. This is maybe not the most recent picture, but it's the picture <laughs> on this website. You can post it on a face recognition software. You put the um, web address here, you include the URL, and then you get a response as a JSON. So in this case, for this, this was done with Face++, we get that the value is 66 years plus or minus 10. But so the way we can access this information is either through a web interface or by using a web address here, a URL. So if we look at the, the URL uh, more closely, it may look like a mess at the beginning, but it's very structured. So there are different parts of it. There is a component that includes the key and uh, the API key and secret that include our authentication uh, criteria. And then the various, the, the link to the URL, the image, and then the various attributes that we request, age, gender, race, and uh, so on. And so what, uh, what we're going to do with the Facebook uh, API, uh, marketing API, is going to be the same. So build these types of queries, and then instead of doing manually, we want to automate them in R in order to make requests. And different APIs are there, slightly different types of, slightly different ways of doing the same thing, but the general idea is always the same. We get 
URLs that combine different pieces of information that include our authentication and the attributes that we want to request from the API. Then we send it in, we get some values back, and we can automate the process. Okay, so now it's been a little while. I show you a little bit tired, so we take 10 minute break, and then we come back and. Uh, so here we'll briefly go over a paper and then provide the tutorial on how to access these types of data and how to analyze them.